I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. This is Book of Mormon Central's Come Follow Me Insights. Today, 3 Nephi 1 through 7. This is a very, um, this is a difficult part of the scripture where there's a lot going on uh, as we lead into the coming of Jesus Christ to the Americas which is going to be preceded by all that death and destruction in 3 Nephi chapters 8 and 9 and 10. The reality is this book is written for our day. Sometimes here's what happens in a gospel learning setting. We go through life and we face trials and tribulations and temptations and adversities and problems, and then we say, okay, I need to go to church, or I need to study my scriptures, or I need to do spiritual things, and it's almost like we have this mindset of, I need to check my problems at the door, oh, come in and relax for a minute in a, in a scriptural setting or a sacrament meeting setting or even in some cases in a temple setting, and that works, but there's nothing wrong with that. What we're inviting you to do today, however, is the total opposite of that. Just try it. Try an experiment. Try not checking your problems, your temptations, your tribulations, your struggles at the door. Try bringing them with you into this lesson, all the baggage, and put it with you on the, the table in front of you with the scriptures. And as we go through the scriptures, keep a prayer in your heart that the Lord will help you make sense of this baggage, that he'll help you see it from an eternal perspective using principles that you learn on the scripture page as they apply directly to your life and your unique set of challenges and struggles. Uh, we've shared earlier in the year this concept that I learned from uh, a dear sister Cheryl Bettinson up in Brigham City years and years ago, this concept that, that she shared with me that sometimes when she would be reading her scriptures, her mind would wander and she would feel bad and come back to the scripture page saying, oh, I'm sorry, my mind wandered and then start reading again, but this time with the mindset of what did my mind wander to? What was I so concerned about that pulled my thoughts away from the scripture page? She would bring that problem front and center back into that same scripture page looking for principles to help her deal with that thing, and that has been a huge blessing in my life as I've applied that. And we invite you to do that very thing here today as we move forward into this particular block of scripture. So. Whatever those struggles, those challenges that you're facing, that you're wrestling with, whatever they may be, bring them. And uh, let's see if we can find heaven's help as we work our way through these, through these principles. I also want to share a little quote from Neil A. Maxwell. How can you and I really expect to glide naively through life as if to say, Lord, Give me experience, but not grief, not sorrow, not pain, not opposition, not betrayal, and certainly not to be forsaken. Keep from me, Lord, all those experiences which made thee what thou art. Then let me come and dwell with thee and fully share thy joy. Brothers and sisters, life is a test. Life is a trial, and we're going to see that in 3 Nephi 1 through 7 in, in a, an accelerated way. There are challenges and there are difficulties that hit us right out of the, the chute in chapter 1. Um, this, this incredible prophet, Nephi, the son of Nephi, is now in charge of, of leading and guiding these people, but he's in a society that has lost a great degree of religious freedom. Some of you have probably heard in the last ten years some of our prophets and apostles speaking very, very openly and urgently about our need to defend religious freedom. 
And maybe some of you have wondered why, why are they making such a big deal of this? It's, it's not that, that big of an issue. When you read the Book of Mormon, you see what happens when religious freedom is eroded and when it's eventually pretty much gone. Now, in this culture, these people who believe the prophecies of Samuel the Lamanite from five years previous, notice verse 9. It came to pass that there was a day set apart by the unbelievers that all those who believed in those traditions should be put to death, except the sign should come to pass which had been given by Samuel the prophet. Human beings collectively are capable of great atro atrocities. This is one of them where a group gets together and they say, if we haven't seen the sign, then everybody who believes that Samuel the Lamanite was a true prophet, then we're going to put him to death. That's where, that's what happens when you lose religious freedom, is you can now be killed for belief, for, for faith, and for hope, and for this religious uh, uh, perspective on life. Let's talk about uh, heavenly versus earthly perspective for just a moment here in this, in this particular context. Uh, we don't let, – let's make clear what we know and what we don't know. If, if this is a calendar, a Nephite calendar, and we don't – they're not using a Gregorian calendar. Everybody's, everybody understands that. They have marked a day on their calendar when all believers in Samuel the Lamanite's prophecies and in the tradition of their fathers, everyone who believes in all of that, they're going to get killed on that day. What we don't know clearly from the text, it doesn't tell us exactly, is where is it that they have – how far in advance have they set that date on the calendar? Was it a month down the road? Was it a week down the road? Was it five months down the road? We don't know that. It doesn't tell us very clearly. So we don't know where it is leading up to that date where Nephi goes and has this experience. This great prophet goes out and pours out his heart to God. So let me, let me clarify here. Let me be clear. This theoretical date on our little theoretical calendar is the date that they're going to kill all the believers. But we don't know for sure which day Nephi has his prayer when he's told that on the morrow come I into the world. It could have been here, it could have been there, it could have been here. It could have been here, on the morrow come I into the world. We just don't know where those two events line up, but it feels like it feels like it's clustered together. Now, why would that be important? Because from a heavenly perspective, God knows perfectly all things, when they're going to happen, how they're going to play out, but we don't. We don't have that view. Even Nephi, this great prophet, doesn't know all the details. It's not like because he's the prophet, this, this declaration is made, we're going to kill all believers, and by the way, if he's the prophet, he's the one who's going to probably witness it all and then be the final one killed. They're probably going to make the biggest deal of him. It's not as if he says, oh, well, I'm not even remotely – everybody just relax, it's okay. It's not going to happen. He didn't do that. He's, he's concerned for his people. Look at verse 11, it came to pass that he went out and bowed himself upon the earth, and he cried mightily to his God in behalf of his people. By the way, you'll notice a pattern there that's very Christ-like. He wasn't crying in behalf of himself. He was crying in behalf of his people. There's something very Christ-like, very mediating about that. Uh, yea, those who are about to be destroyed because of their faith in the tradition of their fathers. And it came to pass that he cried mightily unto the Lord, all that day. So he goes out in the, in the morning hours and he pours out his heart to God and those minutes and those hours tick by and he's pouring out his heart to God. And it says that he poured out his heart all that day until finally at the end of the day the voice comes 
and gives him the answer. Brothers and sisters, the, the question begs asking here, why? Why would God do that to such a good, faithful, um, righteous, obedient servant who, who's so turned outward? His heart's in the right place. He's a good guy. Why would God make him pour out his heart all day? Why not have him come out, kneel down, initially pour out his heart, and God instantly say, it's okay, Nephi, you don't need to worry anymore. I don't need to stretch this out any longer. Why not up front? Why make him pray all day? Uh, One more quote from Elder Neal A. Maxwell. When we are unduly impatient with an omniscient God's timing, we really are suggesting that we know what's best. Strange, isn't it? We who wear wristwatches seek to counsel him who oversees cosmic clocks and calendars. On another occasion, Elder Maxwell said something along the lines of, sometimes it's easier to say, Lord, thy will be done than it is to say, Lord, thy timing be done. Brothers and sisters, let's just, let's break this down for a moment. What happens if God answers his prayer right there? If he he kneels down and initially says, Lord, what do we do? My people are going to be destroyed. And God says, peace, Nephi, it's done. What is the difference between Nephi walking away from that experience versus the Nephi walking home and back to his people from that experience. Years ago, I was uh, sitting on the couch with one of my daughters and she was wrestling with something. She was only 12 years old at the time. And uh, she had been wrestling with this thing for two, three, four months. I don't remember exactly, but it was months. No answer had come. I was starting to get concerned about this 12-year-old girl's faith and I asked her, how are you feeling about your relationship with God? And her response was, Dad, I'm learning to trust him more because I'm having to stretch more. I'm having to to really evaluate what I what I really want most, and it's causing me to trust God more. I love that moment being taught by my 12-year-old daughter that just because I don't get answers when I want them, how I want them doesn't mean that I have to throw up my hands in in exasperation and say, well, fine, be that way. I see if I talk to you again, which is the the spiritual spoiled brat part of my carnal nature that sometimes wants to come out as a reaction versus that quiet, reflective, deep, deep deep-rooted faith and hope in Christ that says, I'm going to keep digging. I'm going to keep searching. I'm going to keep pouring out my heart because I want to know what's true. I want to know what's right. And uh, I love the fact that an infinite God knows better about timing than a mortal like me who's bound by wristwatches and clocks er, and calendars on my wall. That uh, sometimes God delays an answer way longer than we think he should, but he has good reasons, and this is an opportunity for us to exercise faith and trust in him. And that's exactly what Nephi is doing. He didn't give up half at noon. He didn't give up at four o'clock in the afternoon. He kept pouring his heart out all that day. And by the way, I don't think this is the only time that Nephi has been pouring out his heart. I think he's got a pattern of pouring out his heart and trusting in the Lord, and I want to be more like that. Uh, Notice verse 13, lift up your head and be of good cheer, for behold, the time is at hand, and on this night the sign shall be given. And on the morrow come I into the world to show unto the world that I will fulfill all that which I have caused to be spoken by the mouth of my prophets. Behold, I come unto my own to fulfill all things which I have made known unto the children of men. From the foundation of the world and to do the will both of the Father and of the Son. Brothers and sisters, I find it fascinating 
that the very first thing that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the first thing he does on his entrance to the world in his great condescension from heaven to mortality, the first thing he does is he performs the miracle of a day and a night and a day with no darkness in the Americas. Consequently, what happens is an entire group of people who were sentenced to death, they are saved. One of our favorite titles for Jesus is the Savior. I love the fact that the very first thing he does, even just in his miraculous birth and this miraculous sign in the heavens, the first thing he does is he saves. He saves an entire group of people from death. And uh, this beautiful uh, lens through which we can then see what he's going to do for all of us, ultimately, save us from not just death, but from the darkness of hell as well. That is, that is his mission and that's how he begins his life. Nephi <clears throat> shows us a beautiful example here. He's, he's facing the challenges, the struggles of his day, of his family, of his people, and of his society and culture. And there have been many challenges before him in the Book of Mormon, and there are going to be some incredible challenges after this chapter. But I love the fact that he's, he's taking the, the struggles that have been given to him, and he's taking those to the Lord and working through them. Uh, one other quote to share with you, this from, from J.R.R. Tolkien in the book The Return of the King. Uh, listen to this. It is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to, but to do what is in us for the succor of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know so that those who live after may have clean earth to till. What weather they shall have is not ours to rule. So rather than being overwhelmed by all the questions of uncertainty in the future, we just do the best we can to till and to clean up and to produce in that little plot of earth that God has given us and our uh, as individuals and as families to work on so that those who come after us will have a, uh, a better opportunity to grow and progress in life as well. Now, here's the grand irony. The sign is given. Samuel the Lamanite and all these believers, they're vindicated, and you would think such an astronomical sign should convince everybody for generations to come. Well, Look what happens, verse 21, it came to pass also that a new star did appear according to the word, and it came to pass that from this time forth there began to be lyings sent forth among the people by Satan to harden their hearts to the intent that they might not believe in those signs and wonders which they had seen. But notwithstanding these lyings and deceivings, the more part of the people did believe and were converted unto the Lord. So good but there are those who aren't believing. Now look at this, verse 26. Thus the ninety and second year did pass away, so the sign was given in that ninety and second year, and verse 27, it came to pass in the ninety and third year did also pass away in peace, save it were for the Gadianton robbers who dwelt in the mountains. Hmm, so these people, even the Gadianton robbers had seen that sign and it has no effect on them, beyond, wow, that was kind of cool, and then the lyings are sent forth that somehow somebody did something to deceive us, and so they just move on in their, uh, in their slide towards greater wickedness. Look at verse 29. There was also a cause of much sorrow among the Lamanites, for behold, they had many children who did grow up and began to wax strong in years, and then notice this phrase, that they became for themselves they became for themselves. Hmm. 
And they were led away by some who were Zoramites by their lyings and their flattering words to join those Gadianton robbers. That's what happens when we give our life over to the temptations of the devil. We become for ourselves. We turn inward like Satan himself did. It's all about me at that point. It's no longer about the people or my family or about others. It's about self-gratification, self-fulfillment, self-actualization. It's all of this me, me, me perspective that is happening with this rising generation in this, in this uh, uh, culture. Verse 30, and thus were the Lamanites afflicted also and began to decrease as to their faith and righteousness because of the wickedness of the rising generation. Uh, chapter 2 is all about watching this wickedness and abominations increasing and the, the secret combinations growing in their power. And then we get to chapter 3, which is where Gideonhai, the leader of the Gideon robbers, sends a letter to Laconius, the chief judge. Now, let's, let's analyze this because it's amazing that Mormon would give us the entire letter from this terrible Gadianton robber leader to Laconius, but I think there's beautiful purpose in here for having it in the Book of Mormon. We can learn incredible lessons from what's in that letter and how Laconius responds. We can learn great lessons from Laconius. So look at verse 2, chapter 3. Notice how the letter begins. Laconius, most noble and chief governor of the land. It's nice to start with flattery. It's a nice devilish technique. Behold, I write this epistle unto you and do give unto you exceedingly great praise because of your firmness and also the firmness of your people in maintaining that which ye suppose to be your right and liberty. So after we've flattered you, then we start casting out seeds of doubt to get you to, to question reality and, and things as they really are. Yea, ye, ye do stand well, as if ye were supported by the hand of a god in the defense of your liberty and your property and your country, or that which ye do call so. You can just feel it oozing from this letter, these, these techniques. Verse 3, And it seemeth a pity unto me, most noble Laconius, that ye should be so foolish and so vain as to suppose that ye can stand against so many brave men who are at my command, and who do now at this time stand in their arms and do await with great anxiety for the word, go down upon the Nephites and destroy them. So you threaten and you, you speak condescendingly and you, you try to overwhelm with, with numbers and you paint this big picture to destroy all hope. Look at verse 4, and I know of their unconquerable spirit, having proven them, proved them in the field of battle, and knowing of their everlasting hatred towards you because of the many wrongs which ye have done unto them. Therefore, if they should come down against you, they would visit you with utter destruction. So we use all these scare tactics and lies and deception and, and blasphemy. Therefore, I have written this epistle, sealing it with mine own hand, feeling for your welfare. I really care about you and I, I have your best interest in mind. Notice verse, we'll, we'll skip down to verse 7. Or in other words, yield yourselves up unto us and unite with us and become acquainted with our secret works and become our brethren, that ye may be like unto us, not our slaves, but our brethren and partners of all of our substance. Let's not be enemies anymore. Let's just combine. Let's become one. We'll, be, we'll become buddies. We'll be brothers and we'll, we'll be Gadiant and robbers together. Hmm. That's interesting. If everybody becomes a Gadiant and robber, who do we rob from? Who does the work? Brothers and sisters, here's one of the, uh, the ironies of eternity. Evil is not self-sufficient. Evil is a parasite. It feeds off of goodness. It feeds off of light. It feeds off of other people doing the work, putting the effort in to, to produce and grow things. 
This is, this is an absolute lie. Join with us. We'll make you partners in all of our substance because at that point there is no more substance because nobody's doing the work. We're all just robbing. An evil society cannot exist long term. It will implode. It will destroy itself. Um, he, he talks about how good his society is in verse 9 because it's, it's a, of ancient date and it's been handed down to us. And then in verse 10 he says that they're gonna, his people are going to recover their rights and government. They've descended away from you because of your wickedness in retaining from them their rights of government. And except you do this, I will avenge their wrongs. I am Gideon High. Now, rather than, than put tons of emphasis here and, and stopping here, Let's look at how to respond to devilish threats and these efforts to try to destroy society. Let's watch Laconius and as we watch him, let's learn Latter-day lessons from him. What does he do? As you turn the page over, at the very top, speaking of Laconius being the governor, it describes him as a just man and he could not be frightened by the demands and the threatenings of a robber. Brothers and sisters, God does not want us looking down in fear and outward in fear. He wants us looking upward in faith. It doesn't mean that there aren't bad things. It doesn't mean that there aren't threatenings and, and lyings and, and violence going on around us. It just means don't focus on that exclusively. Look up in faith and trust that God knows what he's doing. <clears throat> Verse uh, 13, after, after uh, starting this pattern of faith, not fear, look at verse 13, yea, he sent a proclamation among all the people that they should gather together unto one place. So there's this gathering. You bring people in, either physically or in our world today, virtually. We gather in. Verse 14, he caused that fortifications should be built round about them and the strength thereof should be exceedingly great. You build defenses and in this battle that we're fighting today against the forces of darkness and temptation and sin, we can build those fortifications of faith by doing things like gathering our family around us and opening the scriptures and tuning our ears to, to God's prophets and building up this fortification of faith. He sets guards round about them. Verse 15, he invites them to repent of all their iniquities and cry unto the Lord. Verse 16, so great and marvelous were the words and prophecies of Laconius that they did cause fear to come upon all the people and they did exert themselves in their might to do according to the words of Laconius. They, they jump into action and they get organized. They gather, verse 21, in the center of their lands from Bountiful. If you look at the map, the lands of Bountiful down through the capital city of Zarahemla, in that center striped area of the land, that's where these people are gathering from the, the uh, outer parts into the center parts of the land. And they fortified themselves and they get all their food and everything ready for seven years to be able to subsist. Then in chapter 4, the Gadianton robbers come. There's no way for them to subsist out there because there aren't any people to rob anymore. All the people have left those cities, so it doesn't do them any good to move into the cities because nobody's working out in the fields and working the, uh, the flocks and the herds. So notice verse 5, came to pass in the 19th year, Gideon High found that it was expedient that he should go up to battle against the Nephites for there was no way that they could subsist, subsist, save it were to plunder and rob and murder. What an existence to have to rely on murdering, robbing, and plundering other people in order to, to survive and live. So we want to address a passage that has been confusing to a lot of people and probably has been misinterpreted and misapplied, unfortunately. Uh, we often read scriptures through the lens of our modern day. Now, the, the scriptures were written for our day to apply to us, but sometimes we want to take our present circumstances and apply it back into the scriptures. 
And that's actually not what the scriptures tell us to do. Scriptures are like, help, they want us to learn from them to apply in our lives. And there's this passage here in 3 Nephi chapter 2 about the Lamanites joining with the Nephites. And we have these curious phrases, um, 2 Nephi 2, particularly verse 15, although this whole area, 2 Nephi 12, 3 Nephi chapter 2, verses 12 to 16, this whole passage is interesting. But let's look at verse 15. So the Lamanites become Nephites, and it says, And their curse was taken from them, and their skin became white like unto the Nephites. And their young men and their daughters became exceedingly fair, and they were numbered among the Nephites, and they were called Nephites. And when we took look at the totality of the Book of Mormon, there are actually some interesting clues about what actually may be happening. Let's actually go back to 2 Nephi chapter 4, verse 4, and I've labeled it here on the board. And it talks about the blessings and curses that are associated with covenant keeping or covenant breaking in the land of promise. And this may help us understand partly what's going on, particularly around the cursing. Verse 4, 2 Nephi, chapter 4. For the Lord God has said that, inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land. And inasmuch as ye will not keep my commandments, ye shall be cut off from my presence. I can't think of a worse curse in this life than to not have God's presence with us. Just over the weekend, my nephew got baptized. It was this beautiful ceremony. And of course, we couldn't have everything in the church, and so we went out into his backyard afterwards and uh, after the baptism and, and talked. And the spirit was so strong, and I reflected on how this young boy, Will Fowler, at age eight, had been baptized and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And in that prayer we say, receive the Holy Ghost. It's this ongoing presence of God because we've made a covenant of baptism to, to be joined with God, to take his name upon us. And the promise is we will always have his presence to be with us if we remember him, which is again renewed in the sacrament. And if we go back into 3rd Nephi chapter 2, that is the curse that the Lamanites had had. They had not made covenants with God, therefore they could not have his presence to abide with him. And when they joined in the covenantal community of the Nephites, they got God's presence to abide with them. The curse was removed of not having their presence, uh, God's presence with them. So I just want us to think about how uh, when we look at the scriptures, let's find the principles to apply to us instead of trying to retrograde, put upon ancient peoples our modern day problems. Now, let me just make a couple of other points about the names Nephi and Lehi. Now, we've mentioned this before, and these are just proposals. We don't have final confirmation. But it is interesting that the best scholarship suggests that the word Nephi is an Egyptian word that means beautiful, lovely, goodly, and the word fair. Fair is in beautiful. Now notice when Nephi begins his record, 1 Nephi chapter 1, I, Nephi, having been born of Nephi, or goodly, or lovely, beautiful, fair parents. Notice what happens when the Lamanites join with the Nephites, it says in verse 16, the young men and young women became exceedingly fair. If we translate this back into Egyptian, to be they became exceedingly Nephite. And we actually know the Nephites are this way because of covenant keeping. Covenant making, covenant keeping. Okay? Their countenance would have been white, but white with the beauty of the Spirit of God. Now, if you remember back in 1 Nephi chapter 8, Nephi talked about the tree of life. And how did he describe the fruit? He described the fruit of the atonement of Jesus Christ using words that in Egyptian were just derivations of his own name. He must have loved writing about this. That the fruit was beautiful, fair, and desirable. And he calls it white. And 
I'm pretty confident that none of the Nephites looked white like the shining fruit in the physical sense, but there was a sense of spiritual engagement because of the covenant keeping. Okay, so Nephi is the covenant keeper, beautiful and fair because of covenants. Laman, as we've talked about in the past, may come from the Semitic word meaning uh, la'aman, which means not believe, no covenant. Okay, we've talked in the past that the word believe is actually a is, can be seen as a covenantal word. So when you join in covenant, say baptism, you become fair, desirable, lovely, and beautiful because you are in this covenant relationship with the person who is beautiful and desirable. You become like him, fair and beautiful, and that is Jesus. He is the one who gives us the covenant. So I hope that perspective can help us to see, perhaps in a larger perspective, what may be happening in the society of Nephites and Lamanites at this point, that the Lamanites are converting into the covenant keepers and that we can consider how well are we doing at keeping, at making and keeping covenants and thereby experiencing the full beauty and fairness that God has to offer. Let me just share a few other quick uh, names with you. As you're looking at these stories with these Nephite uh, Gadianton robbers and the Nephite leaders, we have some interesting names. For example, um, we have Gid the Anhi, and then you have Gid Gidoni, And there's a word in Hebrew, you've probably heard of Megiddo. It actually shows up in the word Armageddon. Armageddon is a, is a derivation of the Hebrew word Megiddo. Megiddo was a fortress city in northern Israel that often got attacked because if you wanted to go in and, and fight in Israel, you actually had to destroy the city first. And so it became a symbol of destruction. And today we use that symbolically to talk about destruction. So you notice that this word gid, and it's often the doubling of the D, often any word in Hebrew that has that deals with battles and destructions. And I just find it kind of interesting here that the farm boy, Joseph Smith, uh, people, some people think that he wrote the Book of Mormon, I think. Okay, I've spent 25 years studying Hebrew, and uh, I would have a hard time coming up with this. It's, I find it amazing that Joseph Smith would have come up with these names that actually have to do with fighting and destruction. So, these Gadianton robbers, in the sixth month, verse 7, they come up and look how Mormon describes it. Behold, great and terrible was the day that they did come up to battle, and they were girded about after the manner of robbers, and they had a lamb skin about their loins, and they were dyed in blood. And their heads were shorn, and they had head plates upon them. And great and terrible was the appearance of the armies of Gideon High because of their armor and because of their being dyed in blood. So this huge army in, in this show of force coming up against the, these fortified uh, cities, these people, and this battle is so bad, it describes it in verse 11, the battle commenced in the sixth month and great and terrible was the battle thereof, yea, great and terrible was the slaughter thereof, insomuch that there never was known so great a slaughter among all the people of Lehi since he left Jerusalem. This is the worst battle in the history of the book up to this point. They beat them, they, they kill Gideon High, the, the robber, and then Zemnarihah takes over. An interesting, uh, an interesting character in the book. Zemnarihah, this Gadianton robber who ends up dying, and it's the only story that I know of in the Book of Mormon where somebody gets hung from a tree and then they chop it down and there's this beautiful thing, 3rd Nephi chapter 4, verse 30. And all the people rejoice and cry again with one voice saying, May the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob protect this people in righteousness so long as they shall call on the name of their God for protection. And I will point out that, that phrase, we've talked about it in past lessons, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a phrase to call forth the memory that God will 
preserve his people, and he will keep his covenants as long as they're faithful. Now, this name, Zemnariha, now, this is a bit of speculation on my part, so and this is not going to get you into heaven. I just think it is an interesting possibility that the name may come from a couple of Hebrew words, uh, ze, which means like this or he, and I wonder if this word here comes from the word menorah. If you might remember, the menorah was a stylized tree or candlestick that would go into the temple and they'd light it with olive oil to have light to represent the presence of God. And this last part of the name might mean son or even just Jehovah. Now again, we're not exactly sure, but this name could mean this is the tree of Jehovah, or this is the son of the tree of light. And if that really is his name, I find it interesting that the people hang him on a tree. This is the only instance that I know of in the Book of Mormon, somebody is killed by hanging on a tree, and then they chop the tree down, almost for emphasis to say, you tried to destroy a religion by falsely claiming you're the light of Jehovah, that you're this candlestick of God sitting in the temple, that is a false tree, and we're going to cut that down. The only tree that we will have is the tree of life, which represents Jesus Christ. Now, I may be wrong about this, but the truth is still there that the people were unwilling to leave up for them to look at a false leader. So, after we've, we've gotten rid of this threat of the Gadianton robbers under Zemnariha going north and, and taking possession of the land northward, you'll notice that the people in verse 31 praised God. Verse 32, they cry, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty, the Most High God. In verse 33, their hearts were swollen with joy. Can you see where they are on the pride cycle in your mind's eye? Then you turn over in chapter 5, verse 1. There was not a living soul among all the people of the Nephites who did doubt in the least the words of all the holy prophets who had been spoken, or, or who had spoken. So, verse 3, they forsook their sins and their abominations and their whoredoms and they served God with diligence day and night. And you're thinking, this is wonderful. How long does it last? Well, he gives you the, this beautiful description in chapter 5, in the second half of chapter 5, about how the house of Israel will ultimately be gathered. Now, you and I get to live in the time frame when that prophecy is being fulfilled and will continue to be fulfilled and accelerate. Look at chapter 6. The Nephites all left that center part of the land and they returned to their own lands and they begin to, to farm and to get their, their crops and their flocks going and they, they get grain of every kind and their gold and their silver and their precious things, the north and the south, they're, they're spreading out and everything's great and they're laboring and you're thinking, this is wonderful. How long does it last? Verse 10, it came to pass in the twenty and ninth year, there began to be some disputings among the people. And some were lifted up unto pride and boastings because of their exceedingly great riches, yea, even unto great persecutions. For there were many merchants in the lands and lawyers and many officers. And they started to distinguish themselves by ranks. Verse 14, in the thirtieth year, then the church is broken up in all the land, and except for the Lamanites who were converted because they didn't fall away. I love that description there in verse 14. Now look at verse 15. Now, this cause of, now the cause of this iniquity of the people was this. Satan had great power under the stirring up of the people to do all manner of iniquity and to the puffing them up with pride tempting them to seek for power and authority and riches and the vain things of the world. So, verse 18 is where Mormon jumps in and gives you some description. Now, they did not sin ignorantly, for they knew the will of God concerning them, for it had been taught unto them. Therefore, they did willfully rebel against God. This is a perfect description of apostasy. The Greek word apostasia 
doesn't mean a falling away like it's this external, oh no, things are falling away the way we often talk about it. An apostasia is more of an internal hostile takeover. It's more of a willful rebellion against the truth, and that's exactly what we see going on here among these Nephites. It's only been a few years, and we've been through these incredible experiences where God has delivered us, and we're totally disregarding that at this point. Uh, so now, look at verse 23. Now, there were many of those who testified of these things pertaining to Christ, who testified boldly, who were taken and put to death secretly by the judges. So, you still have prophets teaching, but now people are secretly killing them. That's where the society is, has started to go. And then in verse 28, the old covenants of the devil, those secret combinations, start coming out again. And then in chapter 7, the chief judge is murdered, and verse 2, the people are divided one against another, and they separate one from another into tribes. They've overthrown the government. They now go into their own family tribes, their own uh, little units, and every tribe appointed a chief or a leader, and verse 7 tells us there were but few righteous men among them. Verse 8, and thus six years had not passed away since the more part of the people had turned from their righteousness, like the dog to his vomit, or like the sow to her wallowing in the mire. Uh, Nephi continues to teach in this really, really awful environment. Look at verse 18. It came to pass that they were angry with him even because he had great pow greater power than they, for it were not possible that they could disbelieve his words. For so great was his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ that angels did minister unto him daily." So he's going around and they can't disbelieve his words, but they hate him. They hate what he's teaching because they want what they want, but they don't want the consequences that go with the decisions that they're making. Uh, so, consequently, only a few people in, in verse 21 are converted unto the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, as we finish up chapter 7, the stage is now set for the greatest destruction that this uh, world has ever known, when Jesus is going to be crucified in, in the Holy Land. Over here in America, those, those upheavals and those uh, disasters, natural disasters that are going to occur and the destruction uh, is brought upon them by themselves. It's not like God is doing this to them. These people are setting themselves up for this incredible destruction. Now, we started this lesson inviting you to bring all of your problems and concerns and temptations and frustrations and, and put them on the, the, the desk, so to speak, side by side with your scriptures. As we turn to the Lord and plead for guidance and direction and help and inspiration, even if we've been pleading for hours, for years, for decades and still haven't gotten what we want, Brothers and sisters, know that there is a God in heaven who hears every prayer. He may not answer them the, the same way as we want them to be answered, but he hears them. It's one thing to know you're being heard. It's another thing to, to question and wonder if you're being totally ignored. Just know you're not being ignored. Know that God knows what you're going through, and if you're faithful, and you keep turning to him in that faith, he will give you whatever is in your best interest from his eternal perspective according to his eternal timetables, not our watches and calendars. Uh, I love the Lord, and I, I want to finish by saying something we've mentioned before from the Bible. When you face the, the, the army of adversities and temptations that come at you, don't ever forget that if you have faith, they that be with us are far more than they that be with them.
Thank you for your love and goodness, and we so appreciate who you are and your time with us today. Know that you're loved. <laughs>